I'm Ralph Michaels, currently director of the uh, Center for International and Comparative Law. And we have a very, <coughs> very, very attractive um, event today. We're welcoming Professor James Nickel. Uh, Jim Nickel is a professor of law at Arizona State University. He's also an affiliate professor in the Department of Philosophy. And in fact, his background, it's probably safe to say, is more in philosophy than in law. He was a professor of uh, philosophy and chair of the department for some time in, at the University of Colorado for more than 20 years before that. Currently, he's visiting at Georgetown, which is very convenient for us because it's just a driving distance. And Jim, Jim Nickel teaches and writes in areas of human rights law and theory, constitutional law, jurisprudence, and political philo philosophy. He does so very successfully. If you open his website, you will find that he groups his writings in greatest hits and less known work, uh, <laughs> something I tried to do with my writings, and it turned out they all came down under less known work. <laughs> so I may have to do that um, later when I'm more famous. One of the, certainly the um, greatest hits is the book that came out in second edition, Making Sense of Human Rights. It is so popular, in fact, the uh, copy that the Duke Law Library has is missing. So you may have to buy <laughs> your own one. Now, of course, the book Making Sense of Human Rights is quite closely related to the topic of um, Professor Nichols' talk today. That is the indivisible, indivisibility doctrine um, of human rights. And if, for those of you who've read the paper, you will again have realized something very fascinating to us lawyers, that there's a legal approach to human rights that in many regards is quite separate from a philosophical approach and could benefit a lot from philosophical insights. We tend, as lawyers, to think of human rights in very practical terms, in their implementation, in their enforcement. Um, we don't think so much about the fund foundations of human rights, and even less so about the structural elements involved in uh, human rights. And it is in this area, I would say, that the contribution of the talk today is, is um, immensely helpful. We'll see how Jim Nichol combines, actually, his knowledge of the law and his knowledge of um, philosophy to a, um, a study that's at the same time at a high theoretical level and has very important um, practical implications. The starting point, as you'll see, is the indivisibility doctrine, that is the idea that human rights come all together in a package and are <clears throat> interrelated and mutually supportive. supportive. And he shows how problematic that notion is on an analytical level and also on a practical level, especially um, for countries in the uh, developing world. So this is, in fact, the kind of um, academic analysis that I enjoy most because it has this high um, theoretical, analytical take and at the same time deals with something that we care about very much and that is very important and that I would expect the human rights uh, discourse in the future has a lot to learn from. So I won't talk about that anymore. I'll leave this to Jim Nickel, who says he'll speak for about 20 and or 25 minutes, and then we'll be able to open up for questions. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I have a, a fairly uh, elaborate uh, PowerPoint uh, with 15 or 20 slides. Uh, I think that will actually uh, help you uh, uh, get these ideas, uh, especially if you didn't get a chance to look at the paper. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is to talk uh, my way uh, through uh, the PowerPoint. Um, I like to divide human rights uh, into seven families. It's common to divide them into just two. Uh, civil and political rights on one side, and economic and social rights on the other. Uh, I like a more fine-grained division. I like to talk about security rights, due process rights, fundamental freedoms, rights of political participation, uh, equality rights, uh, ones that guarantee equal citizenship and non-discrimination, uh, social rights uh, that guarantee subsistence, basic health care, education, and such, uh, and minority and group rights. Uh, if you uh, 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 looked at contemporary human rights treaties, and uh, you, you could find a lot about each and every one of those. Each of those would be uh, an important uh, area 
uh, of study. Uh, as my little uh, symbol uh, up there uh, at the top suggests, I'm interested in the interrelations among rights and among families of rights, the way in which they support each other within a system of rights. And that system of rights could be at the national level or it could be at the international level. Uh, I'm interested in both. And this is also an interesting subject, say, within constitutional law. Uh, what's the role that, say, due process rights play in supporting the fundamental freedoms? Uh, interesting question, an important question. Uh, if we're think looking at uh, uh, relations among rights and the ways that they support, and con uh, support each other and conflict with each other, we uh, could do that uh, in a very fine-grained way. We could take two particular rights and ask what their relations are to each other. Uh, the trouble with that approach is that there are so many of them. If we said that there were 40 human rights, that might be a good guess, 40 specific human rights, uh, then when we considered all of the relations to each other, set aside, setting aside relations to themselves, we would have 1,560 possibilities. And so it would be an arduous task. Uh, if we did it in terms of families, which is what I would propose, then we would only have 42. And that's more manageable, although it's still hard to talk about, uh, say, the relationship between security rights generally uh, and, say, rights of political participation. But that is at least more manageable. Okay, so here are the doctrines that uh, uh, I like, uh, that I want to talk about today. Uh, and these are official doctrines of the United Nations. Uh, they're supported uh, by, uh, currently by the UN High Commissioner. Um, I, like, uh, I like the first one the best as a formulation, and I like uh, the one from the Vienna Declaration uh, the least. Uh, notice that the first one says that uh, human rights uh, uh, and fundamental freedoms are indivisible, and then goes on to talk about the full realization of civil and political rights without the enjoyment of economic and social and cultural rights. Uh, that's, a, that's a representative formulation, and I think it's really important to put in that qualification about full realization. Uh, and I'll explain why as we go along. Uh, the Vienna Declaration uh, piles on uh, more words. Uh, all human rights are universal, indivisible, and in interdependent and interrelated. Uh, and says that the human rights community must treat them globally in a fair and equal manner on the same footing and with the same emphasis. Um, uh, I pretty much disagree uh, with uh, that last conclusion. And I also dislike the fact that they left out the part about full realization. Uh, um, more on that as we proceed. Anyhow, that, that's the stuff I'm concerned with. OK. Uh, we also have theoretical expressions of the same idea. And perhaps the most important version of that is in a very widely read book by Henry Hsu called Basic Rights. It was first published around 1980. And then a new edition was published in 96. Uh, Shu doesn't hold uh, that all human rights are indivisible. He says that there are some basic ones which are indivisible. That is, both security and subsistence can only go together. And then they support all the non-basic rights. But the non-basic rights, notice there's no arrows going in the other direction, don't support them. Uh, that's Shu's version. And notice that that's a more, much more qualified claim about indivisibility. You do have indivisible relations. You do have many strong supporting relations. But it's not running in both directions. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, a weaker claim. Uh, we'll come back to Shu. OK, now you may be tempted. Uh, you may think, well, why is this, this guy going to apply all this fancy analytical machinery, all these definitions, all this framework, to what is obviously just high-flown political rhetoric? Why is he taking these ideas so seriously? Uh, I recently heard uh, an, a, a high official in the office of the UN High Commissioner uh, say, indivisibility, just a slogan. <laughs> 
Uh, and you may all have the same reaction. You know, you may think of this as nothing more for, uh, than saying boo for picking and choosing among human rights. <laughs> Uh, and maybe that's all there is to it. Um, the reason why I take it seriously is that there actually are a lot of strong and important supporting relations within a system of rights. And so I think it's at least partly true. And uh, it would be good if we could figure out which part was true and which part uh, untrue. Uh, and so that's really what I'm after uh, uh, in this project. So uh, my purposes are both negative and positive. The negative purpose is to actually criticize or challenge this doctrine to say that it's overstated. Uh, but other purposes are constructive. Uh, I actually construct a framework uh, for thinking about these matters that I think is helpful and that will actually allow us, if we do investigations in this area, to come up uh, with uh, more serious sorts of claims about supporting relations. OK, so let's begin with the idea. Uh, I'm now going to have to introduce some of the framework uh, to proceed. So let's begin with the idea that one right uh, can support another either by being indispensable to it or by being useful to it. And so uh, uh, if it's going to be indispensable to it, we'll say that that's a strong supporting relation. If it's useful, even very useful, we'll say that that's a weak supporting relation, OK? Um, and of course, we would expect uh, that usefulness occurs more frequently in a system of rights than indispensability. We would think that there were probably lots of, yeah, take, take for example, uh, the right to free public education. Uh, that's going to be useful all over the place. <laughs> but probably less, uh, there, there may be few or no places where it's indispensable, right? So that would be the idea, that there are going to be lots of the weaker supporting relations uh, and not so many of the strong, and therefore, if we're going to make claims that depend on these, uh, these relations being strong, we're going to uh, have to tend carefully to that distinction. Okay, uh, then the idea of interdependence. Um, and indivisibility. So let's say that two rights are interdependent if there are weak supporting relations in both directions between them, uh, or a mixture of weak and strong. Uh, and so um, we could imagine a lot of cases uh, where, say, uh, uh, due process rights are useful to the fundamental freedoms, and the fundamental freedoms are useful to due process rights. So that would be uh, an example of weak supporting relations. Two rights are indivisible if there are strong supporting relations in both directions. Okay? And we also need to have the idea of system-wide indivisibility, because that's going to be one of my critical targets. So if, if all of the families of rights were linked together by strong supporting relations, if there, there were these big double arrows between each and every family, that would be system-wide indivisibility. Mm -hmm. And I'm very doubtful that system-wide indivisibility exists, even under uh, full implementation. OK, so let's use some biological examples. Um, and so uh, think first about uh, the relationship between your legs and your heart. Uh, your legs are useful to your heart. Uh, for one thing, they help you to move to places where you can get nourishment and water. Uh, and so that's a form in which your legs are useful to your heart. Uh, and of course, your heart is very useful to your legs, and indeed, it's indispensable. If the heart stops working, the legs will stop working, uh, right? But it's not the other way around. Your legs can stop working, uh, you can even lose your legs, and your heart can still be healthy and functioning, right? So that's a case of strong in one direction, weak in the other. Whereas if we take uh, heart and liver, uh, there we seem, uh, if I've got my biology right, uh, we have uh, strong supporting relations in both directions. Right? That's an indivisible relationship. If one goes, the other goes. And so if we had system-wide indivisibility, uh, you would have that kind of a relationship for all the families of rights or for each and every individual right. Right, so you could take all 40 of them and you'd have 
strong double arrows uh, between each and every one of them. Okay, so this is the meaning of the strong supporting relationship. Uh, it, it's indispensable, it strongly supports, it's necessary. If you don't have it, then you don't have the supported right, uh, and the supported right is sufficient for the supporting right. Uh, that's just to remind you of exactly what I mean. Um, okay, uh, it's important in thinking about supporting re relations to realize that uh, dangers often come with support. And so the very thing that supports a right may also be dangerous to it. Uh, we can imagine uh, biological examples of this. Uh, say, how about regular running can be very good uh, for the uh, health of your heart, uh, but uh, it may uh, also do harm by damaging over, over a long period by damaging your joints. Right, so something that's uh, supporting, that's, that's useful, uh, can also uh, have harm. So to qualify as a supporting relation, uh, we'll have to have a favorable ratio of benefit to harm. And if something that seems highly beneficial, almost ind indispensable, has a strong dimension of danger or harm, then uh, we'll have to subtract, subtract that from its strength. Um, you know that you're really a, a, a weird intellectual uh, if uh, uh, you're wakened at night by ideas. Uh, you know that you actually wake up and say, oh my God, a, a thought. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this, uh, this thought, especially since it came so late, actually did that to me. Uh, uh, I'd been thinking about supporting relations and thinking about them. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, one night, I thought, wow, it all depends on the quality of implementation. How strong the support is will depend on how well implemented or realized the right is. See that idea? And so if we have a very weak uh, uh, right, uh, one that's just barely implemented, uh, it isn't going to do much to help other rights. Whereas if we have a really strong right, one that's very well implemented, uh, that will perhaps have the capacity of doing quite a lot to support other rights. Uh, let me give you uh, uh, an example. Uh, yeah, uh, take a due process. Suppose that our uh, system of due process, uh, you know, of, fair, of, of rights to fair criminal proceedings, uh, and, there's, and there's a whole bunch of them, uh, that the system of implementation of those is very poor. Uh, our courts are understaffed, somewhat corrupt, uh, the officials are poorly educated and poorly paid. There are huge delays, right? If that's the situation of, your, of implementation in regard to your due process rights, then perhaps they aren't going to do so much to protect the fundamental freedoms. See that? Uh, they'll be like, a ver they'll, they'll be like a, a buying insurance from a very bad insurance company, one that doesn't have any phones, uh, that really won't sort of respond to your claim, uh, that seldom pays. Right? <laughs> and so, so you get the idea uh, about uh, quality of, Im of implementation. Uh, another dimension of poor quality implementation is that it's spotty. It doesn't cover some people at all, or it covers them in a very poor way. And if you look at systems of the implementation of rights in developing countries, you often find that that's the case. The system of provision or implementation may uh, be available in the capital, and in a few of the larger cities, but get out into the sticks and you can just forget about it. Uh, you're on your own. It's just like being out on the open sea in terms of the protection of your rights. And so another dimension, we might say, of poor quality implementation is that it often leaves pockets of insecurity. Uh, uh, better quality implementation eliminates some of those pockets. Uh, so we're going to distinguish then between what? No implementation, poor implementation, and high-quality implementation. And that's obviously a continuum. Um, I would think that we would, uh, that we would uh, identify high-quality not simply in reference to some ideal of perfection, but rather in reference to, say, what the best countries do. Uh, uh, you know, if, if you want to sort of uh, uh, know about who has uh, the best fish, 
uh, for, for human consumption, well, you, you, you perhaps ask around and sort of see which market or which uh, uh, restaurant uh, has the highest quality fish. Uh, and then you can use that as a standard for judging the rest. And so, I don't know, uh, take your favorite country, one that you think that does a good job in implementing human rights, Holland, Denmark, uh, say, uh, and use that, uh, if I'm right, uh, as, as, what, as the meaning of high quality implementation. So I'm not talking about some ideal of perfection. Uh, and of course, every system of, right, of protection for rights is probably going to have some pockets of insecurity, some areas where it doesn't uh, adequately deal with the, the threats. Uh, also, I would say that high quality implementation should deal with the standard or most common threats and not every possible threat. Right? And so even the best insurance policies don't cover Martian invasions. Right? So we could expect these insurance policies only to address uh, some of the most uh, important risks. Okay, so uh, this is the thing that woke me up, the idea that the strength of supporting relations depends on quality of implementation. That's just what I've been saying. Uh, and so uh, if you've got uh, if, if you've got, if you want to have a high qu uh, implementation or realization of a right that's of high quality, then it's going to need a lot of support from other rights. But if you can achieve that, it will also perhaps provide a lot of support to other rights. See how that goes? Uh, and so uh, we would think then that the best chance for indivisibility would be under full, uh, full realization or high quality implementation. That's where you'd have the best chance for indivisibility because if you've got low quality implementation, then the relations of support are going to be much weaker. I hope everyone's on board about that. Uh, if you, uh, 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 I guess part of this is to sort of suggest critical thinking about human rights doctrines. Uh, and I certainly hope that you will be thinking critically in regard to the stuff that I'm putting forward. Uh, it's only fair. Uh, and so please uh, be prepared to, to challenge the stuff uh, that I say. So you can now see why the Tehran proclama proclamation qualified its claims by speaking of full realization. The claim of indivisibility or strong interdependence uh, is much more plausible when we're thinking about a fully realized system uh, of rights. Um, I, uh, one reason that, it, that uh, that idea was such a shock to me is that I'd been thinking about this stuff since the original publication of Henry Hsu's book in 1980. And I hadn't ever realized what a huge qualification it is to restrict indivisibility to full realization. But if we do so restrict it, then that means that it's not going to have much relevance for developing countries. Because, uh, and let, let's imagine that we're talking about, say, uh, the bottom third of countries in terms of, say, the World, the World Bank ranking, right? Low income countries, uh, medium income countries, uh, uh, the bottom third, let's say. And mostly there, uh, when, you, when you visit those countries, what you're going to find is that the system of implementation for rights is rudimentary at best. Uh, you'll have some political implementation. Uh, you'll, you'll have some judicial implementation. But the courts will be very slow and ineffective. Uh, the political institutions may not work so well. The police may be somewhat uh, unreliable or even corrupt. Um, and so, uh, lower medium quality implementation is what you would expect uh, in most areas. Now, it may be, though, uh, that in some areas the rights are very low cost and don't require much implementation. And I want to say that I do allow that possibility. Uh, and so if the threat level is low, uh, and if you have, say, good public attitudes, then maybe you don't need much uh, political or judicial implementation. That is a possibility in some areas. Uh, I'll even give you an example. Uh, in, take freedom of religion in Brazil. Uh, Brazilians are, often, are, are generally quite tolerant in the area of religion, even when they are strongly committed to a particular religion, uh, and the threat level is low. 
Uh, and uh, there will, uh, uh, in problem cases, the state would certainly be prepared to take some action to uphold people's freedom of religion. So that may be a case where you can actually get a reasonably high level without much work. Uh, but I think it's a fairly unusual case. <laughs> I think mostly if you want a high level of realization, you're going to have to have quite a bit of machinery for implementation. Uh, that's a hard saying and certainly is worth thinking about, but that's, uh, that's my take. Um, yeah, let's talk about that uh, last sentence. Low quality implementation provides developing countries with a way of moving incrementally into the realm of human rights. Uh, if rights were this, inter this tightly interconnected set, uh, then you would have to have all of them before you could have any of them. Right? If they really were indivisible, then that would mean that the first one couldn't exist without the second and clear on to the end. And so it would mean that there was enorm an enormous threshold to get into the realm of rights. And so I always used to think that indivisibility was bad news for developing countries uh, because it meant that there was an enormous threshold that you had to get into before you could have any rights at all. Uh, once, we, once, though, we introduce the idea of levels of implementation, we see how to get around that. Uh, we see that low quality implementation provides a way of inching your way into the realm of rights. Uh, and as you sort of raise uh, the quality of implementation in various areas, uh, those rights will start to uh, provide support for rights uh, in other areas. Okay. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, human rights are demanding for developing countries. Uh, we shouldn't uh, try to hide this fact. Uh, look at all the stuff uh, that you've got to have if you're going to realize human rights. Uh, you're going to have to have basic subsistence, education, health care. Uh, you're going to have to have a working system of criminal law and due process rights, uh, protections for the fundamental freedoms, uh, some system of democratic political participation, uh, that includes regular elections. Think about all the infrastructure and activity that requires. Uh, protections against inequality and discrimination. Uh, that's quite a daunting list. Uh, but to have any chance of doing that, you're also going to have to have a functioning infrastructure. Transportation, electricity, communication, taxation, bureaucracies. Uh, and a national economy strong enough to support it. Uh, so it's not any surprise, if you see how demanding the menu is, that the poorest countries have a hard time doing it, that they have a hard time pulling off all of those things. OK, so we're still thinking about interdependent uh, structures. And it's important to realize that uh, uh, the construction of interdependent structures doesn't necessarily involve interdependence at every stage of, of construction, right? So thinking about, think about building that Roman bridge. Uh, first, probably, you'd want to build the sort of things out here to the side that support those big uprights at the ends. Uh, and probably what you're going to have to do is to build some kind of scaffolding in the middle, right, to hold the pieces up until you get the last piece in. Maybe you'd just use an earthen mound uh, for that purpose. So you'd build up the round piece of dirt, then you could put all the stones into place, and then you could sort of dig out the dirt. That would be a common way of doing it. But notice then that that's going to be an interdependent system, but the interdependence won't emerge until the last stage. Right? And of course, people might already, to some extent, be using the bridge. Maybe there's just a sort of uh, plank ac across in the middle during earlier stages of construction. And so I think one of the practical questions that you might ask are, uh, what, are the, uh, what, what sorts of scaffolding, what, what sorts of uh, initial measures can developing countries use uh, if they're not able to do uh, the full set, set? I think that's really uh, an interesting and useful question. OK. So uh, let's uh, develop some criticism. I'm almost done. Uh, let's develop some criticisms of system-wide indivisibility. This is the idea that they're all linked together by strong supporting uh, relations. Uh, I think that this is an extremely strong claim. Uh, I would think that a more plausible claim would be something like uh, widespread 
indivisibility. Uh, and even that only under high quality implementation. So uh, here's one reason uh, for uh, doubting system-wide uh, uh, indivisibility. Uh, one is that it seems to imply that uh, all families of human rights have the same degree of weight or priority. But in fact, uh, uh, human rights as we know them within the treaties uh, uh, suggest that some are far more important than others, that you can suspend some during emergencies, but you cannot suspend others. That suggests higher priority. Um, likewise, I think it's the case that rights related to deliberately killing and starving people have special priority. Uh, that's partly due to the fact that, uh, you know, if you take away somebody's liberty, then you can give it back. Uh, maybe they'll suffer some losses in the meantime, but, but they can get their liberty back. But the trouble with losing your life is that you never get it back. Right? And that's one of the reasons for the special priority. Uh, and so, uh, in terms, if you think about various forms of strong diplomatic action uh, and intervention uh, over human rights issues, it will almost always involve cases where there's a substantial loss of life. There may also be cases where it's the substantial persecution of a minority. Uh, there were, after all, very strong sanctions applied to South Af Africa on the issue of apartheid. But I think those are the areas where you're most likely to get uh, a strong international action, and that too, I think, suggests uh, a difference in priority. Uh, another reason for doubting system-wide indivisibility is, it, uh, is that it's so easy to refute. All that's required is that there be one family that doesn't stand in that strong supporting relationship uh, to, the, to the others. Uh, it seems, for example, that it's possible to have high-quality implementation of security rights together with poor implementation of the fundamental personal freedoms. I think that's possible. I think they did it in Singapore, for example. Uh, and if so, that would serve uh, to refute system-wide indivisibility. It wouldn't necessarily refute what I'm calling widespread indivisibility. I'm not sure that widespread indivisibility exists, but I think that that's the more plausible notion. Okay, so here are my key uh, conclusions. Uh, I uh, think that there are supporting relations in many cases, both strong ones and weaker ones. Uh, I don't think that system-wide indivisibility is very plausible. Uh, I think that it's terribly important to take levels of implementation into account, but once you do so, you see that the indivisibility doctrine doesn't have a lot of relevance to developing countries. Uh, and it seems to me that the United Nations statements about indivisibility are therefore broad overstatements of more modest truths. Thank you. Uh, that's the full 11 conclusions uh, uh, that are in the paper, and so if you get bored during the discussion, you can look at those. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to take questions? Or? Uh, I'd be happy if, if, if there are a bunch of them, uh, I'd be happy if you kind of kept the cue. Thank you. Um, you sort of alluded to this already with your reference to the non derogation clauses um, in several human rights conventions, but I just think that this thesis is very interesting in, in relation to the issue of uh, reservations to human rights conventions generally and kind of moving toward a more pragmatic uh, approach in international law toward uh, identifying situations in which those <coughs> reservations would be permissible and wouldn't be. Uh, it seems to me that right now, you know, with this monolithic idea of rights that the, that the UN has largely put forward, the Commissioner for Human Rights, um, it, it's very difficult to think analytically about, uh, and, and moreover, in a, in a way that actually reflects um, the actual state practices at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Have you started looking, I didn't get a chance to read the paper, unfortunately, but have you started looking at all into the issue of sort of uh, specific contexts in which um, under international law, specific derogations might or might not be uh, admissible in, in a way that's consistent with an idea of, of rights still being related to each other overall? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, 
One would be, of course, uh, in the standard reporting process, and a, a country has made its report under the treaty to the treaty body. The treaty body has then gone and done its evaluation, and now they're interacting. And perhaps the treaty body says, well, but you're not implementing this very well, and, and remember the indivisibility of human rights. Uh, therefore, your whole system is going to fall down. And this would allow you to say, well, uh, maybe that one is only useful, not indispensable. Right? And so you would, uh, you would have a possible uh, uh, something there really to discuss. Uh, and I mean, I think that oh, part of the reason for building this structure was to sort of create a structure in which argument could occur. Uh, the other one that you mention is derogation, where a country accepts a treaty ex but says, well, but except for that one. And uh, we, we, we enter a uh, reservation uh, in regard to one of these or one family of these rights. Uh, and uh, certainly the same kind of argument would be relevant. Uh, if you've got system-wide indivisibility, then any cut of a right uh, is going to be self-frustrating. If you say, well, I want to uphold the whole, uh, most of the rights, but I want to cut this one, well then, under system-wide indivisibility, that would just be a contradiction, either a logical or a practical contradiction. Uh, but uh, once you sort of see that the level of implementation issue allows you to wriggle out of that, uh, you see that it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's actually much more of a practical issue worth discussing. Uh, here, here's an example. Yeah, I'll give you a live example. Uh, suppose uh, that uh, some countries uh, have a conception of freedom of religion that does not include proselytization. And, and so uh, in, uh, uh, in signing up for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, they say, yes, well, we agree to all that, except that we understand freedom of religion to not include proselytization. Right? And then somebody comes back with the claim of, well, you can't cut that without sort of destroying the whole system. Well, probably the answer would be, uh, well, the support that freedom of religion provides to other rights, even under high levels of implementation, is mostly weak. Right? I don't think that uh, the fundamental freedoms provide the strongest supporting roles, except in their political dimension. Freedom of political speech is terribly important to other rights. Uh, but, uh, say, uh, the other uh, personal freedoms may not have that strong supporting relation to other rights. If that's right, uh, then we've got a clear failure of system-wide indivisibility. And I would, I would think that the way that this should be addressed is, uh, you called it pragmatic, but maybe empirical. Actually sort of go out and, and, and ask, well, how important is this to the realization of other rights? I'll try to be less long-winded. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the monetary system of the United Nations tends to support a divisibility uh, thesis because each treaty has its own monitoring body. So there's one monitoring body for the political rights, another for the social rights, rights of the child, women, race, torture, etc. Uh, as you will know, suggestions have been made uh, in the UN system to the effect that there should be a single monitoring body which would uh, monitor all the uh, respective conventions. Do you think that would tend to promote the greater indivisibility of uh, human rights protection? Good. Um, I think that's a, uh, that, that's a, a hard question, and I, uh, I'm uh, my general stance is to be supportive of the move to try to at least integrate the work of the treaty bodies to a greater extent. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that often uh, indivisibility is appealed to in order to support that kind of uh, taking all of the rights seriously, right? Uh, and so uh, I guess what I would like about, about it though is that it may well be that uh, if we had uh, integrated consideration, if we had, say, uh, uh, if we were going to look at, uh, say, compliance with women's rights in the context of also compliance with the fundamental freedoms or with due process, then we would really have an opportunity for 
arguing about those supporting relationships within the treaty body. It would actually have to get addressed. Uh, and sometimes uh, 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 I expect they would find that the support is quite strong, and in other cases, uh, not so strong. Uh, uh, I actually think that uh, full realization of women's rights is uh, uh, quite strongly supportive of a bunch of other rights within uh, the whole system. And so uh, there the, the, the news might be good. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, as I was saying before, uh, uh, perhaps that isn't true of freedom of religion. Uh, perhaps you can, have perfectly, uh, you can have perfectly good implementation of minority and group rights uh, without having full implementation of freedom of religion. That's a possibility. Yeah, Jim, um, I'm curious about the relationship between the issue of indivisibility that you were talking about, which I take it is largely a matter of realization or implementation, and a theoretical question, or a question of the justification. Mm -hmm. I wondered if, you, if there's any, in, in your view, any connection between those two. If you thought, for example, that each of the rights or each of the families is bottomed on its own justification, um, then this would be a matter of how then those variously justified elements might be put together into a package that works. Mm -hmm. But it's, in, to that extent, pragmatic. Mm -hmm. If you thought that some of those families, or maybe all of them, if you're really theoretically, you know, um, monistic about it, have a kind of core justification and they address those concerns in some other ways, then you might want to say, you can't have this family without that family meaning that you wouldn't have realized that further principle in the way that the principle demands of it mm -hmm. um, without having both of those. Now, it still would be an open question whether you could start right, by working implementation of one of them and then the others, but there would be an inconsistency with regard to derogation. Mm -hmm. If you have a, an, um, a set that was with a justification of that kind, you say, it's, and, and some state would come along and say, yeah, well, look, one half of that second one, we, we, we buy into and not the rest. So, right. and, and, you, and then there still might be some, as it were, theoretical, but questions of compossibility or sure. theoretical interaction. I'm just interested in how, yes. what your thoughts about the question okay. goes to uh, level. Good. Uh, uh, one reason that I'm willing to be skeptical about indivisibility is that I think that all the families have their own freestanding justifications. Right. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, I'm not like, uh, uh, say, Jim Griffin starts with some idea of personal autonomy as the root of all human rights, and therefore he's got, in order to get to social and economic rights, what he has to do is to show that they're indispensable. Uh, I don't have to do that because I think that there's straightforward, independent justifications for economic and social rights. Uh, that's one thing to say. And, and, and furthermore, even if they were tied together with weak relations, it still wouldn't y yield indivisibility. You could take five freestanding pillars, tie them together with hundreds of strings, and you still wouldn't have indivisibility. They would still stand or fall uh, on their own. Uh, there is a way, though, um, at least for rights that call for political implementation, I think that feasibility is part of the justification. It's a fairly weak standard of feasibility, but nevertheless, I believe that it's there, that it has to be something that the world, most countries in the world are in the position to do something about in a fairly substantial way. Uh, and if that's the test, then we really are going to have to look at uh, uh, implementation and its possibility within the very justification of rights calling for political implementation. If we're just thinking about a right that somehow exists but doesn't necessarily now call for political implementation, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, and so if I'm really sort of interested in justifying the contemporary treaties, which do call for political implementation, <coughs> then I think you've got to look at implementation. Uh, also, uh, I mean, I think, I think it's actually clarifying to our thought if we then have these, this, this menu of ideas or this set of ideas about uh, uh, strength, uh, quality of implementation, both in terms of quality and in terms of distribution. I think that that really is helpful in looking at the real world of implementation. So that's a partial reply. <coughs> um, 
yeah, it's, it's it's good that you use like these examples because you know I, I get lost in um, in the in the language and the neology, I suppose. Um, I'm of the understanding that um, if I cut your leg off right now, um, your heart will stop, independent of a tourniquet or some sort of anesthetic, you know. And mm -hmm. so um, eventually it'll it'll run out of juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if I take your heart out, your leg won't work. Right. It might switch a little while. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 but um, the idea of um, indivisibility um, within the example of a corpus, um, it, it, it seems like um, they are still indivisible, though under certain circumstances they can operate independent of each other. Um, you, you, your, your, um, your explanation of low quality of implementation was based on economic stratifications um, according to the World Bank. Um, when one deals with uh, the lower tier of economies within the World Bank, these are typically countries that have been colonized. And their lack of implementation of um, indivisible human rights or full implementation can often be attributed to their um, neo-colonialist relationship with their former colonizing um, nations who have um, domestically a uh, high standard of full implementation supposedly, you know, but um, internationally um, with their former colonized nations, they have a low standard of implementation. They may actually be subversive to um, the standards of implementation. Sure, I agree with that. And so my question is, um, how does one, in a context such as that, um, how does one um, create the scaffold for um, moving from a low standard of implementation to a high standard of implementation if the standard for high implementation is actually subversive to um, the countries that have low implementation. <laughs> uh, uh, the theory of international development in the current situation is incredibly difficult. Uh, and I think that the story about how you implement a system of rights within a developing country uh, is a really interesting uh, question. And certainly we have to attend to colonialism, we have to attend to the ways in which the policies of the first world, their trade policies are destructive of rights in developing countries. Uh, all of that I agree with. Uh, I would say though that, uh, take a country that was never colonized, uh, Thailand. Uh, I would say that what they've got is low and medium quality implementation uh, uh, in spite of that. Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, you know, colonization, uh, uh, in some cases, delivered institutions uh, that are helpful uh, in uh, realizing human rights. Uh, the legal system uh, that, say, uh, India and South Africa uh, acquired from the British is actually quite helpful, I think. Uh, the, the, the tradition of the independence of judiciary uh, is helpful. So I think it's a mixed story in terms of, uh, of even colonialism. Uh, but still, what we're going to have to look at are what? Uh, what are the economic conditions? Uh, what are the conditions of uh, development of human capital? What are, the development, uh, what are the conditions of developing good institutions at the national level that will actually allow for greater respect uh, for human rights? Uh, those are really hard questions. Uh, one reason that I think that you need uh, a, a practical doctrine of indivisibility is that it really focuses, focuses you much more on the reality. That is, how can we get to, to, to medium quality implementation? And doesn't sort of tell some fairy tale about what obtains under full, full quality or high quality implementation. Thank you. Uh, something that I've been thinking about throughout your talk is kind of the way that uh, some of the examples of higher implementation uh, is sort of premised on, uh, on, on, on like an unnatural wealth that they derive from their colonial relations. I mean, like in America, uh, we are a wealthy country because we benefited from, from slavery, from North, South, Bretton Woods relations, and also from cheap, cheap oil from our relationships, uh, you know, with Middle Eastern dictatorships. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these, uh, all of these create an unnatural wealth, wealth which Western Europe in particular benefits from directly, if you look at the Marshall Plan, and all of these things underlie the, uh, you know, your list of like the six, uh, the six things like transportation and due process, that the, the list of, of kind of precursors to high implementation, all of these things that we benefited from, uh, which I would say wrongly, uh, kind of helped us get to the point of higher implementation. Um, and your, your, your example of Thailand as a country that has not benefited at all from um, 
you know, like like India, for example, got some of the got some of the byproduct of its colonial relationship with Britain. But so what I'm wondering is, it's almost sounding to me like, like to get to a higher implementation, you almost have to have a precursor of of having this colonial relationship, and that just seems wrong. I don't know. I'm just yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see, I don't see that that follows from anything that you said. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, uh, because that's how, that's how these countries got there. Yeah, it's uh, it's ugly, but why would you assume that that's the only way to get there? I'm I'm, I'm not saying that, that that I assume that's the only way to get there. I'm just wondering, like, is there an example of countries that have gotten there without that? Countries that have gotten there without that? I don't know. Uh, 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 that's a a hard and interesting question. We might we might find countries that have gotten gotten there or gotten pretty far. I'm agreeing uh, with, that theoretically it doesn't make sense that, that it would have to be a precursor. I'm just, mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. pouring myself for like a, a data point of an example that it hasn't because... Uh, well, I don't know. Iceland? I don't know. <laughs> Japan maybe? Uh, I mean Japan did terrible, terrible yeah, things during the yeah, 20th yeah. century, but they were still pretty far along bef uh, by say 1920. Uh, so there might be such cases. Uh, you know, uh, this is... Uh, I mean, I think one of the, 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 the sort of hard things about getting older is that you see that the world hasn't really gotten much better, and you start to, you know, and you think, well, it's not happening during my lifetime. <laughs> uh, and there, there's much ugliness in the world, right? And, and, and uh, much sort of history of, uh, of injustice. And our best achievements uh, will sort of have been, pay, you know, have been paid for by slave labor. Yeah, that's how the world is. It's ugly. Uh, but... Uh, uh, still, I think in a lot of countries there's, uh, there's hope for moving beyond that. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the kind of movement toward respect for human rights uh, that we've seen in the last 20 years uh, in Argentina, Chile, uh, and Brazil, where they've actually moved to consolidating democracy, having better functioning systems of law, uh, being better and fuller players in the international system, you know, that, that, that's really a, a nice piece of human rights progress. And if you look at those countries, we see that in many areas they're moving toward medium level implementation. Still a long way to go, uh, but say the way uh, in which the school systems serve uh, children of all classes, uh, Brazil is now much, much better than it was two presidencies ago. So, you know, there, there's the possibility of change. Uh, but, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe not during your lifetime. <laughs> One implication of the discussion here, the notion of indivisible human rights or interrelated set of human rights, is the question of who's going to determine the context of the rights and who's going to resolve <coughs> conflicts between rights, which are certainly needed to exist. Uh, with, and the tendency, at least in modern practice, to judicialize uh, those decisions. At least you're going to try to get certain kind of uniformity. And that puts the courts in an awkward position, either in the position of just rubber stamping political decisions, for example, in the headscarf uh, sort of situation. Mm -hmm. One may have a non-defeasible right to freedom of religion or freedom of religious thought, but you don't have a, at least we know now, certainly in Europe, one does not have a right to certain types of religious expression. And we also know in Europe, uh, for example, one does not have total freedom of expression because you can't deny the Holocaust or the Armenian Genocide in certain areas because you risk going to jail. And again, so courts are put in the position of either having to rubber stamp, which to some extent they've done, or to run the world, uh, subject to very little political control. And you're seeing some of that again in European litigation between rights of privacy and rights of freedom of expression. Uh, mm -hmm. The European Parliament uh, and the European Court of Human Rights have decided that uh, rights of privacy are of equal value to rights of freedom of expression, a position which I think is indefensible, but be that as it may, that's the position uh, that they've taken. Anyway, it does lead to a judicialization. Is that a good thing? To uh, have elites, non-elected elites, uh, deciding these basic issues? Oh. I would think that it's a, a, a mixed thing, but I, I don't want to accept your premise. Uh, I want to uh, uh, get off the train uh, uh, before we reach your ending, uh, at least partially, at least get one foot off the train. Uh, and that is that uh, a lot of the mechanisms that we use to uh, implement human rights are much more political in nature 
and are not necessarily uh, judicial. It may be important to have judges somewhere in the background. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things that I have in mind. Uh, one thing is uh, the, 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 the standard sorts of treaty bodies that we find within the UN system. Uh, uh, the, that system is weak, but the good thing about it is that it is, and indeed most of the UN processes, are there to provide a, an opportunity for sort of ongoing dialogue in which uh, perspectives are shared uh, and in which you hope to sort of send political messages uh, to officials and uh, electorates. Uh, and so I think that the, uh, what shall we say, the educational, the consciousness raising, and the uh, uh, problem solving roles of some of these international bodies are very important. And uh, they may do as much in dealing with the hard cases as adjudication, because often in cases where you have really uh, poor human rights situations, you also don't have very strong international, uh, very, very strong domestic courts. And they may not be willing to take the international courts if they exist uh, seriously. Another way in which uh, uh, I would want to uh, resist your movement to judicialization is uh, it was probably a mistake for the European uh, si human rights system to abolish the commission and to move to a single large court. Uh, I think that within the inter this I'm sorry, this is kind of fancy human rights stuff, and if you don't know it, uh, just uh, uh, believe it anyhow. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, within the inter-American system, I think that the commission plays a large kind of investigative and negotiating role. It sort of says, look, uh, you know, it, call, it calls up uh, Ecuador and says, it looks as though, uh, we've had some complaints, we've looked into them, it looks as though you've got a problem here. Are you prepared to take some action? Uh, if you are, then we will uh, write a pretty friendly report uh, and you won't look bad. Uh, I think that that actually has worked pretty well, and it works pretty well in situations where, where countries are quite a long distance from full compliance. And so a somewhat more problem-solving negotiation, uh, uh, and of course backed up by NGOs that are prepared to uh, blame and shame and publicize uh, violations, uh, I think that that has uh, an ongoing role. And if you, if you do more of that, you may, have, you may do less uh, adjudication. Uh, it should also be said that the, that the outputs uh, of international courts uh, themselves have to be backed up by political bodies, right? And so at the point where uh, the judgment needs to be enforced, there may be further room for negotiation. The country can say, well, our electorate is hotly opposed to this, but we can go this far, or we can make some moves. So we, we may not be prepared to, to abolish capital punishment, to take a live example, but we are prepared to abolish the capital punishment of juveniles. So we'll, we'll be prepared. We, we can't go with you, but we'll move some in your direction. Uh, that may be a successful outcome. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, I often uh, uh, am irritated with law schools because I think of them as being so focused on courts. Uh, sometimes I accuse them of being court schools uh, instead of law schools. Uh, and I think that in the human rights area, we really have to, be, uh, to emphasize the political dimension of human rights progress, the way in which there are a whole bunch of uh, things other than adjudication that will uh, uh, move forward, uh, help us move forward, uh, should we be so lucky. Are we done? Yeah, I, think we're in th <clears throat> I, I hope I didn't promise too much. We had a high theoretical level. We also learned a lot of practical things of how to ensure against Martians, how to build <laughs> Roman bridges, um, <clears throat> but much more importantly, how to think uh, more in a more sophisticated way about human rights, and in the end, I take it also how to be not just a court school, um, but a law school in relation to human rights. So I've learned a lot both from the talk and from the very excellent um, questions and discussion here, which shows that even if the group gets smaller, it sometimes also becomes really, really good. So thank you, everyone, but thanks most of all to Jim Nichol for coming and talking to us.